Out of all the swords in the world of Demon Slayer, only one blade stands apart from the rest. This Hashira created his own breathing style to match his crazy unique blade. We only have 36 hours to forge one of the craziest blades from Demon Slayer, Obanai's Nichirin. I'm Kelly. I'm Tyler. In order to forge this crazy wavy sword, we're gonna have to use every trick in the book. So now let's go meet our friend Kenneth at Red Mountain Makers. We will use everything from traditional forging techniques to modern fabrication to get it done. Kelly doesn't know it, but I have a secret plan and it's gonna work great. But we can't afford to make mistakes with this sword because we only have access to this workshop for the next 36 hours. Kenneth, how's it going? Oh, hey, what's up, what's hey. up? I just heard a thing about blacksmiths. I heard that they never get scared at all because they have nerves of steel. Is that true? I think that's probably true. Anyway, today we're gonna forge open eyes Nichirin, the wavy one from the inside. Oh. Do you think you can do it? It's gonna be a challenge, but I don't think it's gonna be a problem. All right, what if I told you we only have 36 hours? That might be a problem. My name is Kenneth Spivey. I'm a blacksmith, a prop maker, and an educator. This is not just another day at the forge. Let me tell you why. This is one of the most unique swords we've ever tried to create, and every wave has to be the exact same length. The accuracy we will need to not mess this up will be insane. And even though it's a wavy sword, it still has to have a straight blade. That's why, as we always do in mini katana, we're going with a high carbon blend known for its strength and durability. But here's the kicker. The cross section is a six-sided double-edged sword. And we have to make this sword straight, sharp, and ready to slice. And if we use the wrong metal, the sword might snap in half when we try to slice things. And since we only have 36 hours, we have planned out every single process to the T. So hopefully everything lines up and we can finish this blade before we get kicked out of the studio. So Kenneth meticulously planned every step we need to execute because there is no room for error. But you better believe we're gonna give it our all. We have access to this incredible makerspace with a 2000 degree forge, 2600 degree furnace, a word working shop, fabric shop, 3D printers, laser cutters, and so much more. If there's a tool that we need, it's here and we are only limited by our creativity. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to heat up this piece of metal. First I'm going to forge out the tip and then as I work down I'm starting to get those curves in there. This type of forge has two openings, two portals on either end so I can push longer pieces of metal through. I'm not limited by the size of the forge. To take it down I'm going to go over to this anvil here. I'm going to work out the point. What's happening is I'm upsetting the metal, I'm compressing it, and it's getting thicker. So I have to counter that by turning it on the side and hitting down a couple of times to make sure everything's nice and even all the way through. Right now I'm just trying to make it straight and tapered, just ever so slightly tapering up towards the tip before I start putting the curves into it. Now, fun fact, there's a real life sword with waves on it. It actually exists. It's called the Indonesian Chris. And it makes me wonder why they would even make a sword like this in the first place. But I'm sure our friend Kenneth knows more. Obanai's sword that we're making today is inspired by a special sword from Indonesia, the Chris. In Indonesia, the Chris is woven deeply into the fabric of life. It's not about having a wavy dagger in your belt. It's about what it represents. The Chris is believed to possess its own spirit making it a living companion through the ups and downs of life. Its spiritual connection is taken so serious that some Chris are even given their own names and celebrated in special ceremonies. So while here in the West, you might marvel at its craftsmanship and beauty, in Indonesia, the Chris embodies the soul of its nation, its heritage, mysticism, and the endurance spiritual connection to its people. This Suba is really unique and very detailed. Typically, a suba is the artistic point of the sword itself. It's an expression of the user and of the maker. The suba itself has some foliage on it, and it's also adorned with a snake that wraps around the suba. In order to pull this off, we're going to need to pick up all those details. We're going to use a heterobonded clay called Delft, and then once that bottom half is filled, I'm going to put a separator between the two. And then the second half is going to be put on after an object is placed inside of it to get the impression and packed with uh, more Delft clay. We had to have really fine sand so it picks up all the nooks and crannies and all the detail. Once it's all nicely done and packed, we take the piece apart and we remove the positive from the mold, leaving a negative space. This negative space will then be filled with bronze. So what I need to do is I need to put this directly into the burner. I take the crucible out every once in a while to check on the metal. As the metal melts, 
all the impurities float to the surface as slag. I had to take that off in a process called skimming before pouring it into the mold. And now we're getting ready to demold it. Let's see how this thing goes. Look at that. Some people say Chris blades have high levels of lead, but this was actually false because it was not in the metal. The warriors would actually put poison inside their sheath to poison their blade whenever they cut an enemy. I mean, talk about a one cut wonder. So this next piece I'm working on is going to be the habaki. So this is a threatless shear. This is really good for cutting long pieces of sheet metal. In order to have this a nice tight fit, I've created a jig. A jig is a form that precisely matches the form of the blade itself and the area where this habaki is going to reside. So I'm hammering the piece of bronze to the metal that's shaped and I need to have it nice, close, tight fit. Pieces fit really nicely. The two ends come really cleanly together. I'm just gonna hit it real fast with a file to roughen up those edges so that the solder will stick, have something to grab to. So now we're forming the butt cap and this piece has to fit really snug to the bottom of the handle. So I'm taking my handle piece that I've round down and sanded into shape and I'm forming this piece of bronze to the very end of this wooden handle. I need to make sure it's a nice tight fit and these edges line up really nicely. Once these pieces are together and the two ends meet, it's time for soldering. We now had to put the bottom part to make it a proper cap. Oh, nice tight fit, look at that. We're forging open eye sword, but I'm gonna to try to include traditional elements from the Chris, including earth, sky, creator, and humanity. Okay, we have earth from the iron in the sword, but we need some humanity. Kenneth, are you human? I, I think I am. Okay, now we just need the sky element, maybe some lightning or something. Kenneth, does this outlet work? Okay, so now what I'm going to do, it's I'm going to start working on the horn of the anvil. So what's happening when I'm making these curves, the outside edge of a curve is going to stretch and the metal is going to get thinner. The inside of the curve is going to compress and get thicker. All right, we're finished with the forging process. This came out beautifully. The curves are all accurate. Everything's in line and level. Point lines up. All the curves are directly dead center. So let's move on to grinding. Since this isn't a traditional sword, there's no way we can use traditional methods. It would take forever and be extremely difficult. So this type of sword has a very prominent spine in the very center of the blade. And we're getting that by having concave cuts. So these cuts are swooped in and it causes a high crest or a high peak that I'm trying to maintain all the way down. So we're going to use sandpaper and I'm going to go over this surface once again and that's going to smooth everything out. So grinding and sanding is complete. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to heat it up and then douse it in oil. And this will harden the blade and then we'll need to temper it. have two oils that we're going to douse in. Only one of them is what we're going to use, and that's the used motor oil. This will increase the carbon content, making the outside layer hard in a process called case hardening. The case hardening means the outside layer is hard while the center remains flexible. This is really good for a sword because you want a nice hard edge, but you want the center to be flexible enough that it won't break on you when impacted. If you take out a sword that's being quenched while it's still bubbling, you can cause flash fire. All right, so now that it's been quenched and hardened, the next thing we need to do is we need to hone this edge and put a nice edge on it. I want it to kind of look chipped away, like the black is kind of fading into the edge, so it mimics the look that's in the mangas. 
This has a very prominent ridge in the center, nice spine. And in the manga, it has a highlight to it as if it's been worn. So I can bring that out by lightly hitting it with a file. The lettering that's on the blade itself, I thought really long and hard about how I'm going to approach this. I can mask it off and sandblast it. I can acid etch it out. I can put it into a laser engraver and engrave it out that way. But in this case, I want to do it by hand engraving it. A modified file has a rounded edge to it, so I'll make a really nice bold cut into the metal. I'm gonna use an old technique where I kind of whittle the engraver back and forth to cut the lines. Being a blacksmith does have its benefits. I was able to create my own graver out of an old file. This steel is harder than the metal that makes up the sword, so it should have no problem cutting through it like butter. When I was working for the jewelry industry, one of the things I did was learn engraving. I learned a lot of jewelry work, working with gemstones, working with silver and gold, and I learned from arguably one of the world's best, Sal Malfano, I went to his place, took private lessons with him. Okay, it's been an absolutely crazy day. We've started working on the blade, the handle, the suba. But we're on a deadline and the makerspace is kicking us out for the day, so we'll see you tomorrow. Okay, it's day two, we're back in the workshop and we just forgot the most important part of this sword, the sheath. So I'm gonna make a sheath and Kenneth is gonna make a sheath and we're gonna see which one turns out better. Now, in order to make the best sheath for Obanai's Nichirin, we need to know what makes him tick. So I called my friend Yasin to give us the inside scoop on what goes through this guy's head and how he does his work. Yo, so if you're gonna design Obanai's sheath, it needs to be perfect. Nothing can be wrong and nothing can go wrong. Designing this sheath will be the hardest challenge you will ever face because it's not like any other Saiya in Demon Slayer and it's not like anything we've made at Mini Katana. I mean, you have to be very particular about the design because if it's even one centimeter off, you won't even be able to draw the blade. You've seen the manga panel about this, right? So there's a lot of debate on how Obanai's blade is actually sheathed. I make an Obanai's sheath and one of the challenges I have when making this sheath is I actually have no idea what his sheath looks like. So at Mini Katana, we make a nice easy sheath that just slides on and off and you can wear it on your back and it is sick. But I know a secret that no one else knows. The author of Demon Slayer actually gave us a cheat code for how Obanai's sheath would work. My sheath will incorporate bronze fittings, a white lacquer, and scales to mimic snakes. So the way I'm gonna make this sheath is with leather and a zipper. So you can just zoop, unsheath, zoop, Sheath. Okay, don't tell Kelly, but I have a perfect idea for the sheath and it's gonna work flawlessly. How to hand sew leather. What up fam? Today we cover how to saddle stitch leather. Stay tuned. Plan is to make the outside layer of wood, cut and mimic the blade, and then possibly put a flap of leather over it. So we're trying to build a sheath that matches the curvature of the blade, right? We'll build one of these, but it's curvy like the blade, with an open face on one side. But the open face, we attach a zipper to it. At best, my sheath is just a guess of what this character's sheath is actually going to look like, but I think it'd be hilarious if when the show does finally come out and the character's sheath is revealed, it looks exactly like mine. Okay, Kelly doesn't know it, but I have a secret plan and it's gonna work great. And it involves this. So we make a lot of swords at minikatana.com and we actually sell a version of the Obanai sword. So I'm gonna buy one off our website, ship it here, and use that sheath. Okay, I just ordered it, I hope it fits. So Kenneth is currently building the sword right now, right? But I don't know if I have the skill set to insert a zipper onto curved leather and it hurts my brain because you got to do like weird inside out techniques and problems will happen and I don't know what the problems are yet. Well, I got the shape done and now I'm thinking about texturing it. This might actually work. I got three stitches. Oh my goodness, that looks good. Bro, I could be a surgeon. 
All right, now it's time for our first zipper test, and then we're gonna glue this thing down one final time. All right, we're gonna zip it. Oh yeah. There we go. So now I've painted it, and I'm going back over it with a file to expose the black burnt wood underneath. So you have that contrast between white and black, which is indicative of the design. That's what you call engineering. So the leather zipper sheath turned out okay. It's kind of boring, just beige, so I'm gonna paint it, and this is either gonna redeem it or it might destroy it. I have three colors. First, I'm gonna start it with this blue as a base coat. Next, I'm gonna do a layer of black. Oh baby, it has arrived. So let me explain my absolute genius because I ordered an open eye off our website and my plan is to just use this sheath and say that I made it. So hopefully it fits on Kenneth's custom sword. Let's find out. Okay, Kelly and I finished our sheaths. Now we're gonna see which one is the best. Kenneth, observe. I went with a very clean and elegant basic black sheath and I hope it fits. This was handcrafted in the leather shop by me. This yeah. is really, really clean. Yeah. You use the sewing machine? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I use that. This is really nice. This will definitely work. It's wide enough they can yeah. just go straight in yeah. and come straight out, I think. Is it? Because I don't know if it is. I haven't tried it yet. <laughs> so big oh, it does oh. work. Tyler's sheath looks nice, but mine actually fits. Hand sewn, hand cut, everything about this. This is a lot of detail in it. Made by the me. zipper's a good idea. Oh yeah. Maybe this one will fit. Ah, we have a fit. Oh yeah. But now do we have a zip? Mid battle, gotta resheath your sword. Oh, a little horror here. Uh, there he is. Well, yours at least fits. Oh yeah. <laughs> I think if you went with a finer zipper, it would have been much easier to zip and unzip. Yes. Those are really nice, but I went ahead and made my own. That looks so good. Is that wood? This is wood. And the cutout? Dude, that's like a little roller coaster. Oh yes. A little Hot Wheels track. There you go. Oh dude. The scales, look at the scales. Okay. He also handmade an end cap, and this, I guess like loops to your belt, that is actually so nice. These are both sick, but which one is your favorite? Comment below. This is a really unique handle, leather, and material that alternates between are two completely different materials. You have a cotton-based material that's dyed purple, and then you have a white leather. Yeah, this is a little strange having both leather and fabric. I usually see one or the other, but not both together. And this alternation back and forth is interrupted briefly by another piece of leather, which is black. I'm trying very hard to keep this as true to the manga as possible, but it's also very difficult to tell exactly these colors. Is it white or is it slightly blue? You decide. All right, I'm finishing up now and the last thing I'm doing is getting this knot. I had a little tuft here on the end because I can't find any source materials to tell me exactly what type of knot they used. So this is as close to the assessment as I could possibly come up with. Okay, Kenneth is putting the final touches on this sword and I can't wait to see if it can actually slice. All right, we are finally ready to assemble this piece. This was a crazy build. Let's see how well they fit. Will this look like Obanai's sword? Will it turn out 
Will it look correct? Will it cut? Let's find out. You guys ready? Ready. Yeah. Three, Let's see it. two, one. What? Dude, this looks Bro. crazy. Dude, how it does looks it look so, so good? Accurate. So accurate to the show, yeah, too. Yeah, the Suva, I don't know how there's that much detail on no, it. No, that and doesn't make sense. These little black but things on the like, handle. On the edge of the Suva, though, you can tell it's like kind of handmade. Like, it looks super deep. Dude, I think it looks sick. It's incredible. And the etching? Dude, no Dude, way. that looks so good. The leather on the handle is crazy. Yeah, that is awesome. Okay, the what? sheath looks dummy good. That is so cool. Yes. But now let's find out if it actually slices. First up, we're gonna test this sword on some easy objects like this melon. Oh, that was easy, dude. Okay, I'm gonna use both edges of this sword to pa pow back and forth. Ready? Oh, let's go. Okay, we know it can slice, but what about piercing? That was brutal. For hundreds of years, these mats have been designed specifically for sword quality testing. So let's test out a normal katana like this, then we're gonna test out our Obanai katana. Oh, this sword is so good. Now we're gonna finally put Obanai sword to the test. If this thing can slice, you better subscribe. subscribe if you liked this video our other forging videos were even crazier so check them out right here